Thanks to Nebula for sponsoring this video. Yes, we are constantly bombarded with bad news about the climate crisis, and that's because it's a very serious issue. The stakes are high. You probably shouldn't be eating those, by the way. It's already affecting people, and the price of not solving this problem is vast, or is too large to imagine. But amidst all of the terrible headlines, there is good news out there, and I don't think people talk about it often enough. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video. To be clear, I'm not talking about the unexpected upsides of a warmer climate, like summers being warmer, or there being more CO2 for our crops, because that's bad. And actually, that's bad. I'm talking about how much progress we have made towards fighting the climate crisis, and how the future is looking brighter than it did a decade ago. Prior to the Paris Agreement in 2016, this is how much warming scientists expected the Earth to experience by 2100. 4 degrees Celsius. And to be clear, that would have been a total disaster. Like, almost certain collapse of global civilization disaster. Now, however, current government policy that's actually in effect is expected to limit that warming to 2.7 degrees by 2100, with an error bar. 2030 targets that are a little bit beyond what we currently have in policy are expected to limit it to 2.5 degrees Celsius, and long-term targets that aren't anywhere near policy just yet are expected to limit the warming to 2.1 degrees. All of this, by the way, is courtesy of Climate Action Tracker. Definitely check out their website. Now, you've probably heard that we want to limit global warming this century to less than 2 degrees Celsius, ideally less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this 2.1 degree number? Well, it's not good enough. But two things. Firstly, consider just how much we've already brought that number down. Remember, this is action that has happened since the Paris Agreement, so in less than 10 years. And while that number isn't low enough yet, we shouldn't lose sight of just how much we've accomplished so far. And secondly, this number? is only based on submitted long-term targets. In other words, this isn't as good as it gets. There's still plenty of scope this century to bring the number down further, to less than two degrees. Though achieving any target is another matter. And if we're optimistic and assume that all long-term net zero targets are met, then that number goes down to 1.8 degrees Celsius. As I say, that is optimistic, but it is far too soon to say for sure whether we will hit those long-term targets or not. Stay on target. But the early signs indicate maybe we will. And I say that because the world has demonstrated we can decouple economic growth from emissions. The average person today is wealthier than the average person 10 years ago, and yet does not emit more carbon dioxide. In Europe specifically, the emissions per person have fallen dramatically, as they have in the United States, and yet both of those economies have continued to grow. And no, that's not because they outsource their emissions and their manufacturing to somewhere else like China. You can account for that. This is genuine decoupling, and it's a huge deal. Because, for the time being at least, we live in a world governed by capitalism, and so the most important thing to governments is increasing individual economic prosperity. What's been demonstrated recently is that they can do this without wrecking the planet. And in fact, in many cases, doing so the low-carbon way is now the cheaper way of doing it. But you might say, that's all fine for Europe. What about China, the world's largest emitter? Their carbon emissions are still going up. Are they even, though? Analysis indicates that China's emissions probably peaked last year and will systematically fall going forwards. That's in part because China has rolled out a truly breathtaking amount of renewables. Did you know that last year China added more solar capacity than the United States has in its entire history? Solar and wind capacity in China will overtake coal capacity this year. Globally, solar will have the largest installed capacity of any way we generate electricity sometime next year, and in less than five years, renewables will account for 42% of global electricity generation. The installation of renewables worldwide is happening so much faster than most people realise. The International Energy Agency reckons we may very well hit the ambitious goal of tripling renewables capacity by 2030. I see this as an absolute win. But to be clear, while we are really successfully decarbonising carbonizing how we generate electricity, electricity is only part of how society uses energy. It's actually about 20%. So progress here is going really well, progress here, not so much. 
heating, transport, various other smaller sectors, these are all still vastly dependent on fossil fuels. And in fact, the overall share of energy that comes from fossil fuels hasn't changed all of that much over the past couple of decades. Decarbonizing this bit? That is the mountain we still have to climb. But here's the thing, with cheaper renewable electricity, it's now becoming increasingly viable to electrify some of those sectors, see heat pumps or electric cars, for example. Yes, before you comment, better options are available, but these can be electrified too. I did a whole video about transport. But there are still several sectors that have been historically labelled hard to decarbonise, such as cement and steel. You can't really electrify those and their current manufacturing techniques inherently produce CO2. But solutions have now been found to those hard to decarbonize sectors. I previously made a whole video that was an in-depth look at one possible solution to decarbonizing cement production. And we think that we can decarbonize steel production through the use of green hydrogen, amongst other techniques. What we previously thought were impossible challenges to overcome now have practical solutions. And that's kind of true across the board. Those solutions now just need effective support from government policy to be rolled out at scale. And on that note, more voters than ever care about the climate crisis. And in fact, most people in the 20 most polluting nations on Earth support policy on climate change. And generally speaking, the younger you are, the more likely you are to support such actions, such policy. So as more members of Gen Z become eligible to vote, we're going to see a continuous continuation of the current trend for more and more ambitious policy to limit climate change. Because political parties now know that not taking action on climate is only going to cost them votes. Your local mileage may vary. Which raises the hope that our current government here in the UK of cartoonishly incompetent ghouls willing to sell future generations down the polluted river for short-term profit may not be in power that much longer. I think that was impartial enough. Now, I'm sure that there are several people out there who have watched the video to this point and have laughed at what I have called good news, saying that it's just not good enough. And yeah, the action that we have taken today on climate is not enough. But there is no contradiction between acknowledging the severity of the situation we are in and the insufficiency of action to date, and acknowledging the progress made to date towards sufficient action. I don't want you to leave this video thinking that we have solved the climate crisis, because we haven't. We are nowhere near minimizing the threat we face in 2100. But to say that there is no good news about the climate crisis is simply not true. The recent past has shown us that activism, political pressure and lifestyle changes have worked. And to ignore that fact only invites despair. And despair is not a useful emotion. Despair only limits future action, which we know will make a difference. We need to keep going until our response is sufficient. So no giving up. We cannot solve a crisis that we do not understand. But fortunately, there are some excellent climate journalists and authors and indeed video creators covering this crisis. Finding these creators can be difficult, however, with the YouTube algorithm often serving you the video equivalent of fast food. Fortunately, though, a curated list of climate creators, including Climate Town, Our Changing Climate, and myself are all on a platform that prioritizes the viewer experience. So that means carefully selected creators, no advertising, and high quality, independently produced, exclusive content. It's called Nebula, and uh, I partly own it. Nebula was created by a roster of educational creators as an alternative to YouTube, a place where we didn't have to run adverts, and crucially, that we owned, and we had say over how the platform developed. And Nebula has developed into a powerful force and innovative funding model in online video. We've financed films, new series like Jetlag, and classes. I, for example, got funding to make a class on how to communicate science through video, turning data into stories. Recently, we've also funded Real Science's Archaeology Quest and Real Life Law's epic video essay on the Yugoslav Wars. Nebula's mission is to create a place for people like you, people who watch lots of educational video and who want to see it develop 
and if my recent comments are anything to go by, develop away from the monolithic YouTube algorithm. And in that space, you can enjoy content from your favorite creators, videos, and podcasts, and know that with a view on Nebula, you are supporting those creators far more than with a view on YouTube. If that all sounds good, then check out Nebula at nebula.tv slash Simon Clark, where you can get 40% off an annual plan. That link again is nebula.tv slash Simon Clark. Check it out. Massive thanks to my patrons over at patreon.com forward slash Simon Oxfizz, the many now names going past me are my executive producer patrons. Patrons get early access to videos, they get exclusive behind the scenes content, including a vlog every month, and producer tier patrons and above get to vote on a video topic every month. If you like the stuff I make and you'd like me to make more, then please do consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This was the first video I've made since publicly announcing that I am somewhat pivoting how I come up with video ideas. So let me know what you thought of this down in the comments. If you'd like some recommended viewing next, here's some I made earlier. And that just leaves me to say, please consider doing the YouTube pleasantries, dropping a like, subscribing, and thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.